if you have something that's inherently three-dimensional in nature, imaging it with a 2D technique or from a 2D perspective can create um, ambiguous answers or in the worst cases, even kind of misleading conclusions that you can uh, infer from that. Um, so yeah, that's of course why in a simple case, when you go to the airport, they don't just scan your bag from one angle, they do it from two angles so they can infer something about the, the 3D distribution of things. So, okay, how do we actually get 3D data? Well, the, the simple setup of these types of instruments is you take an X-ray source, you shine some X-rays on a sample, and so be transmitted through the sample and, and create an image on the detector. And the, the trick that we play is we then collect one of those projection images, but then we rotate our sample and we collect many of these projection images at, at different angles. And this might be a few hundred or even a few thousand of these different images. And then we use a computer program that does what's called a reconstruction step, basically a computer algorithm that will then backtrack and say, based on all those projections, what is the, the three-dimensional structure that was responsible for creating all of those projections? And once you have that, you now have a, a 3D virtual model on your computer. And, and you know, I say the world is kind of your oyster at this point as far as what you'd like to do with it, but you can sort of arbitrarily go and, and virtually slice it at any given angle you like, interrogate it um, however you, you see fit. Or, of course, you can go and feed it into a variety of uh, 3D image analysis routines to, to quantify and then measure different features or, or whatever might be of interest within the structure. And we see people from the academic world doing a whole variety of things with these types of instruments. And this, you know, as working for the microscopy company, this presents both the, the appeal of the technique, but also the challenge, right, where we want to be able to, to reach a variety of your users and, and do some exciting things. And, it really spans everything from the big heavy stuff with big chunks of, you know, say concrete being kind of on the extreme end of, of the large objects we look at, all the way down to very small and sometimes quite low density things from, from the biological or, or biomedical world, um, plant science, uh, all different types of material science kind of in between here, spanning a range of different sort of object sizes and densities. So what I want to do in, in the few minutes we have today is I've kind of broken up my talk into two parts. One is giving you a little bit of a technology introduction and I'm not going to go too deep here, but just to give you a flavor for what's developed over the last few years and, and why that's exciting that because you'll, you'll very soon have this capability on campus and the types of things you can expect to do. Um, but then pretty quickly I'll move into part two, which will be kind of the, the meat of it and give you know, a pretty quick survey of, of just a variety of applications to get you thinking about the types of science that might be interesting. Okay, so jumping into to part one, um, the, the very brief uh, history here is, um, you know, I work at Zeiss, but uh, initially this division at Zeiss was a company known as X Radia that started out in the, the Bay Area of California. Uh, it was a spin-off of synchrotron-based X-ray technology, meaning the founders essentially took some of the, the optics and, and types of um, imaging um, equipment that was available and developed for synchrotrons and said, well, what if we can build laboratory tools that can do, you know, 90, 95% of what you can do with the synchrotron, put it into a lab setting and make it much more accessible and, and broadly available. Um, so that's how things all got started. And that's really been, I would say, the consistent uh, theme and motivation behind the company ever since, which is looking to synchrotrons uh, quite a bit for inspiration as far as um, instrument design and seeing what we can do in a lab setting that, that mimics it you know, in many ways quite closely. Um, and since then, of course, now these, these lab-based tools have become prolific around the world and um, putting them in kind of four broad buckets here as far as the types of applications, everything from material science to natural resources and, and geoscience, and I would say kind of earth science, I, I put in this bucket as well, um, uh, biology or life science, and, and then the electronics. Uh, and semiconductor space as well. <laughs> so this slide's a little bit in, in jest, but um, the, the idea I'm trying to get across here is, uh, and you know this to be the case if you've ever applied for beam time at a synchrotron, because there's only a handful of these facilities in the world and there are many scientists who want to use them. Um, access is the uh, enduring problem with synchrotrons. And, this was true even during my PhD six, seven years ago. Um, you, you have to apply and you have to wait in line. 
And if you're lucky, you get three or four days, maybe per year to run your, your experiments at a synchrotron. So that, that was very much the motivation is, um, can we help people to, to shortcut the line, so to speak, by providing access to, to attractive instruments in their lab that um, you know, maybe there's still a little waiting period, but not nearly as, as brutally competitive uh, as a synchrotron. And so I wanted to put things now, as I dive into the exact instruments we're gonna talk about in the context of the, the 3D imaging space. And what I have plotted here is on the x-axis is this 3D voxel dimension. Um, voxel is nothing more than a three-dimensional pixel. Um, so this is uh, kind of equivalent to spatial resolution, although not, not exactly. Um, on the y-axis, we're looking at sample size. This is some kind of characteristic sample diameter, so to speak. And so as is typically the case, as you move from left to right here, you go from imaging large volumes down to uh, more, more targeted and more narrow volumes. And X-ray instruments fit in a, a pretty nice gap here, or what I should say was previously a gap between the world's very high resolution SEM and, and FIB type of imaging, um, or FIB SEMs, and what previously existed as just really like a large scale industrial CT. So there's a bunch of instruments out there that you know, are meant for looking at things like you know, engine blocks of cars, for example, um, at kind of coarse length scales, looking for you know, horrible defects and porosity that might exist in castings for industrial purposes. Um, but the XRM instruments kind of fit in this middle part of the spectrum where we're, we're kind of on the, the boundary of the micro and, and nano worlds and dealing with samples that are anywhere from a, a very visible macro size of you know, centimeters all the way down to, to microns in size um, and doing it in a non-destructive way, really being the, the key strength of the technique. So I wanted to, to say a few words first about the ultra instrument, um, which is the, the box right here. Um, we do make a, a very nanoscale 3D X-ray microscope from Zeiss um, called the X-ray Ultra. It comes in a couple different flavors The way this instrument works is we add some x-ray focusing elements into it. These are, are pretty unique in a lab uh, x-ray tool, um, namely a, a glass capillary condenser lens and a Fresnel zone plate uh, diffractive optic. And the reason for incorporating optics, as with any you know, optical microscopy technique, is you need these to, to properly focus your beam, and these really are the things that dictate the resolution. And we find that by incorporating these elements, um, acting directly on that, that X-ray beam. And like I said at the beginning, it's tough to focus X-rays. They kind of just want to go through anything you put in their path. Um, but if you do it properly, you can, you can do imaging down on the tens of nanometer kind of length scale. And this is just a, a resolution test pattern here showing um, 50 nanometer lines and spaces uh, in the, the middle of this star pattern. But where I actually am going to spend pretty much all of the rest of the time during this talk is the X-Radio Versa. Um, this is the instrument that will be on its way to, to US very shortly. Um, so it does get into the submicron world. Um, kind of the 500 nanometer is really the bottom edge of spatial resolution, but then from there up into the micron scale as well. It covers a very broad um, application space and, and range. And as the name suggests, it's uh, versatile. Versa comes from and, and why it makes such a good instrument for a, a sort of multi-purpose um, academic research environment. And namely, um, a year or year and a half ago or so, we, we updated uh, this line of instruments with the 600 series Versa and, and really gave a pretty thorough overhaul to the entire platform, helping our users to increase their speed, their image quality, the resolution, um, the overall stability and, and performance of the system. Um, so, it, you know, you'll basically have the, the latest and greatest showing up on, on campus very shortly. So that's, that's actually quite exciting. You're, you're joining a pretty elite and, and young club of, um, of people who have access to these latest instruments. And like I said, we, we really do a, a variety of different things. This is just showing um, some images of different types of samples mounted within the microscope. Um, people interested in electronics and semiconductors sometimes stick entire wafers in there um, or other large objects. And this, this image is shown a little bit as a joke, right? It's a, the skull of a great white shark duct taped to a flower pot. Um, 
it, it does, to be honest, speak to the, the flexibility as far as sample preparation and mounting is required for x-ray imaging. It's not like SEM or TEM where you need to be very careful about maybe coding your sample or mounting it properly and being compatible with a vacuum environment and all these things. Um, for x-rays, it's quite a bit simpler. You just got to make sure it's not going to move. Um, you can incorporate a variety of rigs. So this would be an option um, at some point uh, in the future. If there are folks uh, at Florida who want to do in situ experiments, you can consider getting one of these in situ loading rigs to put into the microscope and um, put mechanical or thermal load on your sample. And then of course you can just kind of look at, you know, small test objects, you know, whether it's a mechanical test sample or geological samples and so on. So I wanted to take just a minute to, to talk a little bit about a, kind of a nuance of the technology here. It is a, an important aspect of how the microscope performs and how we produce you know, high resolution compelling data uh, with X-ray tomography. And the short image or video here, I'm using obviously an apple as kind of my generic uh, demonstration sample in this case, just because we all kind of know what an apple uh, looks like and the size. And this is showing your, your typical CT geometry, right? You have x-rays shining through that object and they're illuminating a detector of some kind. And you can see the same as producing shadow puppets on a wall. As you move the relative position of these three different things around, you're gonna get different levels of magnification onto your detector, right? And that's how x-ray tomography has worked for, for years and years and is kind of the, um, yeah, the origin of the technique, so to speak. Um, but there are limits, right? Because you can see, we want to put that, that apple close to our x-ray source to get a big projection, but you can only move it so close, right? I mean, the apple itself accommodates some physical size. So if you don't want to cut it, then you're kind of at the limit here of how close you can put it to, to that x-ray source. Um, so that's where, you know, about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, X-Radia came along and they said, okay, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to change the detector design, incorporate some optical elements into the det detector so that we can further magnify that image before ultimately uh, collecting the data. And so that's where you can switch optics here and go and change a level of magnification at the detector level, which is pretty unique in, in this lab-based space, and use that to, to really zoom in in the interior of objects and get super high resolution compelling data inside of something without cutting it open. Right, so of course we're we're just looking through a number of different examples here, and we'll see see some more of these in a few minutes. Um, but this was kind of the the breakthrough that I would say really revolutionized three D X ray imaging in the lab, and and what has made these instruments so popular. Um, so to look at a, a fun example, this is a little um, battery from a smartwatch, um, so about an you know, inch or so in size. And we like to follow um, this procedure of, like as you typically do with microscopy, you start imaging things at fairly low resolution, you, you find what looks interesting and then you zoom in. And we do the same thing in 3D where we progressively change the lenses and, and select the location that we want to image and perform higher and higher resolution tomography scans as we go. And that's where the, the difference really comes out in, in the Versa that the, you'll have in, in your lab versus um, some of the other uh, conventional CT systems that, that exist out in the world, which is as you zoom in further and farther, um, you tend to lose resolution on a conventional CT and, and the Versa will, will manage to maintain that in most cases. Now it turns out, um, if you combine actually these two types of technologies, you do kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, because one thing these, these normal uh, traditional designs are good at is, is looking at big things and doing things with speed advantage in that regard. Um, so the instrument that will be coming to Florida will actually have both this advanced um, optical detector design as well as a, a flat panel detector integrated into it. And this really covers the broad spectrum of everything from, from pretty big objects down to, to small things and super high resolution. So you'll have quite a flexible system in that regard. So that's, that's pretty exciting. And it lets you do fun things like this where you can Again, you can image entire objects, then progressively zoom in. In this case, it's finding some cracks that exist, um, changing our magnification and performing additional tomographies to look at this internal cracking structure. And again, this is, we're looking at kind of 2D cross sections here for the sake of visual simplicity, but this is all three-dimensional data in 
inside the middle of an impact object. And similarly in the biological world, um, this is a bear jaw. It's about six inches uh, in the, the long dimension here, so fairly large object. And we can follow a, a similar procedure if you're interested, for example, in the interface here between the tooth and the bone, and you want to see that at very high resolution, you can go and zoom in. And in fact, they have a, a nice little video of the same sample. And this is the way we, we normally collect data, right? You, you want to get an overview first. You've got some context and some navigational guide of where it is you're going in many cases. And then you go and, and pick regions and you say that spot, that's my region of interest or that looks interesting because I see evidence of X, Y, or Z feature or structure. And I go and, and perform additional scans and collect higher res 3D data at very targeted locations. But the benefit here is you're then keeping that within the context of this larger volume you've already seen. So you really do build up this multi-scale picture and, and analysis of, of how these different um, Length scales and features connect to one another. Cool. So, so shifting gears a little bit, you know, there's different ways we can use X-rays to our advantage as well from a contrast perspective. So, similarly to the way a light microscope or an electron microscope has different types of signal you can collect. We can do similar things with x-rays. Um, the most common is absorption-based imaging, right, where you're just looking at different attenuation of x-rays, but we can also look at um, phase contrast, which comes from relative phase shifts of, of that x-ray as it propagates through different um, uh, regions of material. And most recently, we've added a capability for diffraction contrast tomography. And, and this is super exciting because this will be on the system at Florida. And uh, this one's really the cutting edge uh, and sort of hot x-ray technology today, if you will. There's a couple synchrotron beamlines doing this around the world and then only uh, a handful of customers working on this technique in the lab. So this is super exciting that um, you'll have access and the ability to do some experiments with this DCT. So to look at each of those kind of quickly, um, Absorption is exactly what it sounds like. It's an, uh, an attenuation-based contrast mechanism, so it works on the average atomic number of that individual phase. So we can look at things like different types of fibers that might exist in a composite material. With what's called phase contrast, it's a way of leveraging differences in propagation speed of the x-rays, so no longer their attenuation, but now the other component of the refractive index, which is a relative phase shift through different regions of material. And this can help to highlight interfaces that exist, say between similar densities. It can help to highlight particularly low Z phases. Um, we've started doing a lot recently in the pharmaceutical world, people looking at kind of drug delivery particles that exist down on the, the micro to nano scale um, and looking at how their 3D morphology affects their, their drug delivery behavior. And in the geosciences as well, where quite often we do have you know, multiple mineral phases of pretty similar density, and that's tough to pick up in absorption because that density-based contrast is so similar to the phases. But when you look at it in a propagation mode, you suddenly get nice highlighting of the, the interfaces between those different uh, regions. And I have a, a little video here showing the results of that, that phase contrast scan. Where as we go through, you'll see some of these little uh, glass inclusions that exist within the quartz structure here. And that really helps with what you usually want to do as your next step in the image processing is you want to actually go and measure or count a number of things or quantify it. So it, it makes it a little easier to do segmentation and, and subsequent quantification of, of your objects. And this is my the kind of one slide highlight of, of DCT. The idea of, of DCT is looking at crystalline materials. So uh, a sample that is polycrystalline, it's all the same density. So in normal X-ray imaging, you don't see anything about the crystal structure, right? Um, but if you, it turns out if you play some games with the way you collect data a little bit, you can actually collect, of course, diffraction signals coming off a crystalline material, kind, kind of sort of like XRD. Right? But if you collect those diffraction signals, then you can backtrack those spatially to where they originated from within your sample. 
and gain a picture of the three-dimensional grain structure that was producing all of those diffraction spots. And then you can map out um, 3D grain location, morphology, orientation. Um, if you're familiar with EBSD, you can sort of think of this as, as kind of a 3D EBSD in a non-destructive sense. It's not a perfect analogy, but that's, that's kind of the type of data we're going after. Um, I'll have a couple more slides on this shortly. So that was the overview. And then I think with uh, the 15 minutes or so we have left, I'm going to give kind of a whirlwind tour of some different examples here. Um, and starting with an overview from the material science and engineering world, like I mentioned, it's, it's kind of everything under the sun. And I would say that the commonality here is if there's three dimensional structure or morphology that is related to the, either the processing or the performance of the material, probably a, a good candidate or something where x-ray microscopy uh, may be valuable. Oops. And uh, one of the very obvious cases of that is looking at fiber composites, right, where the, the failure mechanisms that exist in these materials, of course, is very different from our classic engineering systems like metals where we have, you know, fatigue problems and cracking and corrosion and so on. But here you have, you know, this very explicit uh, fiber structure where down at the individual fiber level, you can start to get breakage and, and pull out and fracture, and then eventual propagation across different flies or layers of the fibers, right? So seeing how they're distributed in 3D can really be useful to inferring how that damage might occur. Um, of course, today, there are many folks in the, the engineering and metallurgy world paying attention to additive manufacturing, um, offer some exciting possibilities to create either customized or, or complicated uh, parts in a 3D geometry. Um, in the metals world, these all start with these powder-based uh, approaches. And the distribution and, and sort of quality of this powder is a, a major factor in the types of things that we can do with AM. And that's been kind of well noted by a number of the researchers that they're, they're limited or, or they're constrained to a large degree by the quality and the type of powder that they can start with. And so one of the things we can do when you start to interrogate these in 3D is you can look at the, the different types of features that exist that would impact its performance in, in that printing process. Um, so things like the, the range of particle sizes, do they have non-spherical geometry in 3D? Are there so-called satellite particles, basically little ones that are um, clinging on to bigger ones? And maybe most interestingly in 3D is internal porosity, right? So have what looks like a big particle, but then it's actually got uh, a void or some small particles inside it. Then, of course, once you, you use this to print some kind of 3D structure, you want to evaluate the quality of that, right? There are still maybe some problems in the community that have not been 100% re resolved related to defects during the build process, right? So depending on the parameters and how you move your laser or electron beam around as you melt your powder, you may get things like little voids or, or cracks or stresses that can develop. So it can be useful then to create test pieces where you go and, and scan them and look for these types of defects. And in this case, it's, it's very bad defects. We have huge voids here. It was, it was actually somewhat intentional in this test case. So we, we expected to find these, but you can nonetheless characterize their distribution and, and their shape um, and how they affect the rest of the 3D volume. And then in the end, most of the reason people are using uh, 3D printing is because they want to make things that are unusually shaped. Uh, and this is an example of that, looking at a, a 3D printed lattice made of uh, Inconel alloy. And here on the right is labeling a bunch of the, the little micro pores that exist within the, the struts of that alloy. And then, as I mentioned in the beginning, we can do what, what we call 4D experiments, which is image the same 3D structure in numerous steps of time after we've done something to it. And in this case, it was put through a heat treatment process to try to um, remove some of this remaining microporosity. So you can look at the exact same structure numerous times and look at how the internal 3D features are affected by whatever it is you're doing to it. Um, so in this case, we can watch that, that evolution of porosity. Well, if you like that, some errands. I'll be back later. Okay. Um, so I, I wanted to show a little bit about this lab DCT because this is super exciting that this will be coming into to Florida and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to what the teams down there will do with it. And um, 
to, to elaborate just a little bit on the setup I described before. The way this works is we're, we're still illuminating our sample with a, a broad beam of, of x-rays, but now we incorporate a couple additional elements, an aperture and a beam stop, so that we can collect diffraction signals on our detector in a um, meaningful way. And you get a whole bunch of these spots, and as you rotate your sample, the, the spots move around as the, the crystalline planes of the, the different grains also move. And then uh, using a specialized reconstruction algorithm, you can basically take all of these spots and then back it up to say, what is the, the grain structure that produced all of them? And the reason this is interesting is because it gives us non-destructive three-dimensional grain structure that may be related to other things that are going on within our, our material system. So uh, a short case study I have of that was from Nick Chawla, formerly of Arizona State University, recently moved to Purdue. but. He was doing a study of these aluminum alloys and the challenge he was having when he was doing normal uh, x-ray imaging at, at a synchrotron actually, he noticed you get really bad corrosion at some surfaces and then other spots you don't have much corrosion. And so he was trying to hypothesize are these related to these little inclusions, which are these bright spots here, but how come some of these inclusions have really bad corrosion damage around them and others seemingly none at all? Right, so there's some other factor at work here in the microstructure that's making one spot more damaged than the other. And so what we did was we said, okay, well, we can still image the inclusions, and that's what's shown here, all these little bright spots. But what if we also do diffraction contrast tomography so that we can image the grain structure? And then we can overlay these two data sets. They're, they're spatially correlated. And we can look at where the inclusions actually exist relative to the individual grains. And now we can add kind of this layer of, I guess, complexity, but a, this layer of insight into our structure and the types of factors that may impact its performance, whether that be corrosion or, or possibly mechanical properties or, or thermal properties for that matter. So we can see where all these little inclusions exist relative to grain boundaries. And we've done this all without actually destroying the sample. And when you don't destroy it, it means you, again, you can watch how these things change over time. And this, uh, this study came out of the University of Manchester, but they were looking at essentially grain growth, right? So this is kind of a common area of study in the metallurgy world is um, how do grain structures coarsen under different types of heat treatment typically. And so they took um, this polycrystalline structure and put it through different heat treatments for different amounts of time and then measured how those grain sizes evolved. And you can you know, quantify and plot the results and, and even interrogate on the individual grain level, how do some grains grow and, and other grains uh, shrink or essentially get eaten by the big grains, right? And so you, you can actually try to match that to some of the theory that, that describes how these coarsening processes should occur. So shifting gears a little bit into the, the world of life sciences or biology, um, we have done quite a bit here and this is actually a lot of the origins of X-ray CT imaging come from you know, the clinical world. Humans or, or animals for their, uh, their internal structures. And we have covered kind of a pretty broad range of, of things within the life sciences world. I've got a few fun examples of that. Um, some are kind of uh, biomaterials or spanning the world of, of material science and life science. Um, but one of the interesting structures are these cuttlefish. So it's a creature that looks something like this. And they're known for these big bones that they have that have a very interesting three-dimensional structure. Um, you can see kind of the layered nature of that structure here on the image on the right. So I'm going to jump forward to this video um, because we'll see it in a little bit more detail. Um, it's known that the, these bones kind of serve two purposes, right? As with any bone, it's meant to provide structural support, you know, structural rigidity to the animal. Um, but in the case of the cuttlefish, it also provides buoyancy control, it seems, by, by somehow um, changing the, the nature of the, this mineralized tissue or, or water permeating through external membranes that can actually adjust their buoyancy. My apologies, I'm not a biologist, so if I got that a little bit wrong, please, please forgive me. Um, but from a structural standpoint, uh, incredibly interesting, right? You have this, uh, we call it the apartment building structure, where you have multiple layers here and almost like a hallway type of uh, mazes uh, through the individual layers. So a great case where a three-dimensional approach 
shows you something about that anisotropy that you wouldn't get with kind of a, a more simple 2D uh, technique. And in kind of the more classic life sciences world, also looking at um, mineralized tissue structural mechanics, right? So you can treat bone in different ways and, and go and perform mechanical tests, take a little indenter and poke it and create some damage in that bone and then go inspect it at, at very high resolution and look for things like cracks and, and where they originate and propagate relative to the intricacies of, and, and the osteocytes within that, that bone structure. Um, we've also looked at some other rather elaborate uh, natural structures. This is a, a mouse cochlea. This was a, a data set we ran actually with Stanford uh, probably about four years ago at this point. Um, I like this video just because it shows the, you know, the incredible amount of um, structural variation and complexity that we can see in the natural world. And as a mechanical engineer by training, I appreciate that because it kind of feeds into this idea of bio-inspired design and biomimetics and, and learning from some of the structures that we see uh, in the natural world. It's a pretty, pretty amazing uh, internal structure here. And uh, it's not only mineralized tissue, but, but cartilage um, and soft tissue as well. So this is a quick example looking at a, a mouse knee joint where we can differentiate um, bone and cartilage layers based on their contrast. And if you go and zoom in, you see that even in a little bit better detail here. Um, you can see you know, pretty strong density differences between these different phases. And that's kind of my, my segue into a little bit more of the, the paleontology or, or the geological sciences world. This one's looking at a uh, fossil. And of course, the thing that makes uh, fossils or, or maybe paleontology or archeology span so interesting from an X-ray tomography perspective is usually we don't wanna cut up our samples, right? In many cases, these are quite precious materials or, or truly one of a kind. And so using a non-destructive imaging approach where we can really interrogate them in detail, um, but do it in a non-destructive way can be pretty appealing. And into the, the world of geosciences and geology, um, we do quite a bit of work here with X-ray imaging because similarly, um, a lot of these geological systems, and in this case, it's sandstone, it's kind of an oil and gas uh, application, but they show heterogeneity and complexity across multiple length scales and dimensions. And so being able to tie in high resolution data sets where we can really see the fine details of porosity to the larger scales of, of differences in maybe mineral layers or, or macro scale porosity can help us understand either the mechanics or maybe the fluid flow properties of what's going on um, within the pore structure. And we, we started doing some, some pretty exciting things about three, four years ago, initially in the, the geosciences world, but, but propagating out even more broadly in, in applications of correlating data between different methods and generally, but in the specific case here, looking at 3D x-ray data, combining that with um, elemental data that you can get from a technique like EDS within a scanning electron microscope. And if you have a common surface there, now you can correlate the, a 2D plane with a single slice of that 3D plane and you can use some clever algorithms to try to propagate that elemental or compositional information into your 3D volume, right? So trying to essentially mimic a 3D EDS kind of approach uh, in a non-destructive way. Um, so there's been a handful of cases where this has really been uh, a valuable approach, particularly in, in the geosciences, but um, I think there's probably more opportunities for it as well. And the last part of the application space I wanted to touch on briefly was um, the world of electronics and semiconductors and people looking at either reverse engineering or cyber security um, or either you know, device fabrication for that matter. And we have seen you know, a range of different sample types from kind of small uh, packages and small electronic components up to big boards and wafers. And this is where um, the, the X-ray microscopy methodology for magnification can be useful because in various spots on even a big object like a, you know, a dinner plate size wafer, you can get high resolution data at, at just about any location. So whether it's the center or the edge, you can see this little bump and, and via that exists. We've done all kinds of things in this space that I would 
say, in all honesty, the biggest applications here are within the failure analysis world. So a lot of the electronics packaging industry um, has these instruments for doing this type of thing. But even within the academic space, um, folks who are either fabricating devices um, or looking at yeah, kind of cybersecurity types of research, um, there's some interesting things that can be done here. And it's great because the, these, these types of systems represent um, a sort of a, a, a perfect example, if you will, of a case where three-dimensional structure really matters. And heterogeneity and anisotropy to that structure is, is super prevalent. And this is becoming more and more so as the electronics world moves to increasingly 3D structures, basically the layered structures that you see here, um, as opposed to you know, a single layer of uh, circuitry or, or transistors. So this is my, my summary slide and um, a sort of a, a fun, uh, I hope, fun last summary slide. If you want to go on your phone, you can go to the App Store and look up this Zeiss AR metrology. It's free. You don't need any special login or permission or whatever. Um, but you can grab this and um, within there, there's um, a little app or a little um, tool that you can find the uh, X-Radio 620 Versa. So the instrument that will be arriving at Florida shortly. And then you can do fun things like this, where you can um, have your, your home office assistant um, unsuspectingly next to a miniature version of the Versa sitting on your kitchen floor. And you can take your phone and go and, and move in and, and kind of uh, in an augmented reality kind of fashion, investigate or look at the different components that exist within the instrument and watch little videos that describe what's going on with the different components and, and so on. So I think it's, it's kind of fun. So I think we have maybe a couple of minutes for questions. If there are other questions that come to mind, feel free to, to ping me an email. I'm very happy to, to follow up and, and chat. And otherwise, um, yeah, thanks again for the invitation and having me. Oh, thank you so much, Will. Um, so any questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, you, we can, um, if there are more questions that time that we have to answer, uh, we will make sure to have the answers for you in our website um, next week. Um, so let me see if there are any, can you, you can see the chat, right, Will? I think so, let's see. Yes. All right. Okay, so yeah, um, I see some notes for the other upcoming events. Yeah, if there are, if there are any questions, feel free to let me know, or if, or if you have other, maybe other types of samples or materials in mind that you're working with and you're not sure, um, maybe we'll, you know, if there's been previous experience there or, or any additional examples I can provide, um, feel free to reach out. We've got a big library of, of data and examples to pull on, so. Okay, can you expand on how the phase contrast actually works? Okay. Yeah, so, um, so the, in terms of implementing it on the microscope, the, the difference is very simple. Um, you move both the X-ray source and detector farther away from your object. So it's increasing the propagation distance that the x-rays actually have to traverse. And the result of that is as x-rays go through a material in different um, phases of that material, they will propagate at slightly different speeds. And when they emerge on the other side, essentially that manifests itself in a little interference fringe right at the boundary of where those two wave fronts are propagating. And if you let that traverse enough distance, that fringe basically grows and grows as it moves in space, and it gets big enough that you can actually detect it on the detector, right? So that's what you're imaging when you see kind of a little halo or a highlight of an edge. You're actually seeing this little fringe that's developed at the, the interface of those materials. Um, so that can be useful because they're the density or the attenuation difference may be very, very small, imperceptibly small, but that, um, that fringe may be detectable. So that can help you to essentially find edges. Think of it as a, an edge enhancement approach. All right, thank you, Will. Um, our next event is gonna be the RSC Facilities Virtual Tour. You can find the Zoom link in the uh, chat. Um, it's going to be a tour, a live tour through all the RSC facilities. Uh, so um, I'm going to stay here a couple of more minutes in case someone has more questions. But um, for those of you that want to join um, the virtual tour, it will start in uh, about one minute at 10.50. Thank you so much for attending 
our presentation today. Thank you, everyone. And I, I do see a couple more questions. I'll try to ping you guys afterwards and, um, and follow up. And yeah, happy to try to provide answers to those. All right. Thank you so much, Will. Thank you.